Hello and welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other words too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah. And this week I'm going to start right away with my good thing, which is we are replacing our roof. I was going to wait until it was done and my good thing would be that my roof has finished being replaced, except you are going to hear a nail gun periodically throughout <laughs> this recording. <laughs> uh, my dad, and my husband, and a couple of friends are up there as we speak, and I'm being a jerk taking a podcast break. Well, I appreciate you taking this podcast break. In my defense, I've been up there like eight to noon most days this week. You can't work in the middle of the day. It's way too hot. But yeah, roofing. That's very exciting. That's my answer for all of our questions today. What am I drinking today? (laughs) Roofing tar. (laughs) (laughs) Read anything lately? Roofing shingle packages have instructions for how to roof. And I cannot imagine trying to put on a roof with nothing but those little diagrams (laughs) on the back of a plastic package. That sounds awful. Who needs that? I bet, no, I bet that it's really useful if you're doing a small hobby project. Like if you want to put a roof on a chicken coop, for example. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Like you're not a professional redoing your entire roof. You just need a little bit. Okay. All right. Fair enough. (laughs) I was imagining trying to like figure out how to cut around vents without my dad's help. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) No, thank you. No. No. I can barely manage the nail gun. He keeps giving it to me and I try and then uh, immediately mess up and say, I'll just carry the shingles around the roof. That'll be my contribution. <laughs> I No, I've, I've been doing some nail gunning, but I'm not as fast at it as men who can actually like extend their arms away from their body with this big old heavy nail gun. I have to like shuffle around with it so it's directly underneath me all the time. And your father has also been doing this for years, so it makes sense that he would be faster than you. Oh, him, yes, but also uh, the amateurs. Oh, your your husband and yeah, yeah, and and Specs, our friend, that we've roped into helping us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're much better at it than me, also, <laughs> and they have been doing it for not as long because I've been roofing with my dad since I was. Technically 18 months old. Little baby Lily holding a nail gun. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I'll tell you this. I'm not afraid of heights. (laughs) Anyway, sorry for the nail gun noises, but not sorry because screw you guys. I need a new roof. (laughs) Those were all of my answers. I'm not actually drinking roofing tar. I am drinking Pinot Grigio from a box because my mother is here and I am her daughter. (laughs) Anyway, Sarah, do you want to just breeze through? You have some better answers than me. They are not all roof related. (laughs) They are not all roof related, although I would at some point like to get a new roof. So I'm quietly jealous over here. You better get in line. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I would get I would get my stepfather to do my roof, except he's too busy redoing their bathroom. Yeah. So I feel that. <laughs> yep. Anyway, my good thing is that my copy of the stage play of This House arrived finally. I bought it like a month and a half ago. It was coming from the UK. So that's why it took so long. And This House is a play that explores the dynamics of the British Parliament between 1974 and 1979. Wow, fun. I know, okay, I know it sounds really dry. Like, it sounds like the least interesting thing ever. Um, But I watched it last year because it was streaming for a week as part of um, National Theater's National Theater at Home program. And my God, it was good. Like I watched it twice in the span of a week. I just, I absolutely loved it. I would give organs for them to put it like up on streaming again on their streaming service. And they have thus far not listened to my pleas. (laughs) What are they going to do with an extra kidney? (laughs) I mean, you never know, like, but uh, seriously, it was so good. Please, National Theater. I know you listen to our podcast. Please, please put it back (laughs) up. For the record, I knew that I I saw that bullet point coming, which is why I staged my dismissive answer. 
I I did figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> I know you knew. <laughs> I don't want everyone to think I was just being rude to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, even if you had just been being rude, it does sound pretty darn dry. Like, there's a reason why I had that bullet point. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> but you needed an in to explain it to everyone else. I appreciate you taking one for the team. And other than roofing tar, what are you drinking <laughs> this evening? I was going to make an Arnold Palmer with green tea from Tandem Tea. And I even made lemonade for it this weekend with lemons from my lemon trees. But it's cold and windy, so I just opened a bottle of red wine. Mm. Yeah. Arnold Palmers are delicious, but they're definitely a summer drink. They are delicious. And they are a summer drink. I'm hoping that I can have one at some point. Also, because I have all of this lemonade that I now made. But. <laughs> it better heat up then. It does need to heat up. Inform the Bay Area. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, if it was last year, the Bay Area would have listened. This year is a return to form in some respects. That's maybe good overall. Probably. I don't think that this is the case for the rest of the like state. Mm-hmm. Or the rest of the West Coast, really. But Other than my texts complaining about how hot it's been. <laughs> Read anything good lately? <laughs> I started reading Kings of the Wild by Nicholas Eames because I'm taking a break from Wheel of Time. And this book has been on my TBR for a while. But the Friends Talking Fantasy podcast had an episode recently about how they were going to discuss this book for an upcoming episode. And I was like, this is a good incentive to read it. So I started reading it. It's great. It's like D&D meets classic rock. It's a lot of fun. Oh, that does sound good. Yeah, I would recommend it. That's Kings of the Wild with a Y. Yes. For the record. <laughs> yes, Kings of the Wild with a Y. There is a sequel out too called Bloody Rose that I do <laughs> own but have not read yet because obviously I have not read the first book. To avoid spoilers for The Wheel of Time, Skip to 1636. Sarah, I am very upset with you because you sent me a well thought out argument for why I should stop making fun of that one part of Wheel of Time. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Someone on Twitter posted a link to a Reddit analysis. And if you're listening and you've heard previous episodes of ours, you may recall at one point in one episode, um, we discuss Matt and his relationship with Tylen, or I discuss and Lily just kind of interjects comments because she hasn't actually read the books. <laughs> hey, that's my best skill though. <laughs> it's a good skill. We'll link the Reddit post in our episode description, but it basically is arguing that Jordan was very intentional with how he treated Matt and Tylen and their relationship and really Tylen's rape of Matt and that there's no, although there's no actual like moralizing, it's because everything is from the point of view of this unreliable narrator who doesn't view what happened to him as rape, even though it was. And it was a really thoughtful analysis that looked at the text in a way that I had not taken it on my first read so you're welcome for uh, not allowing you to continue to complain about it <laughs> <laughs> this specific element anyway this specific element it really addressed all of the issues we brought up with that whole relationship point by point and had mm -hmm. very thoughtful rebuttals for all of them mm -hmm. one of the specific uh this might have been <laughs> extra meta but there was another comment that you linked about how robert jordan was specifically addressing the issues involving rape culture in the 80s and 90s and how this topic was supposed to make readers feel uncomfortable and then question why they felt uncomfortable and then realize some of the implications of coercive rape etc cetera, etc cetera. i think the reason why that didn't quite land for me having not read a single word of Wheel of Time, <laughs> is that there is no question. I don't need to ask why do I feel uncomfortable. So maybe that is really just a an era thing. Because when you first sent this to me, my immediate reaction was, 
it sounds like he kind of chickened out and didn't make it as blatant as he could have. Because you can definitely have actions in a book, even with a, a narrator, that are displayed as strongly one way or the other by the author. I think that's, you know, word choice and all of those things can really sway the reader's experience of a situation, regardless of the people involved. But with the added context of, yeah, obviously this wasn't written in 2020, <laughs> where, <laughs> you know, anytime recently, him having to go more subtle with it than I would have liked makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I agree. And it's that's not something that, I mean, you, he's dead, you can't really go back and interrogate him about it. And you can't ask, well, if you had been writing it, you know, in this day and age, would those scenes have changed? But it kind of reminds me, oh, this is completely, it's not completely off topic. A little <laughs> bit, a lot off topic. There's that pretty well known, it's always sunny in Philadelphia bit because of the implications. If that means anything to you, it doesn't. That does not, that does not mean anything to me. That's fine. I, I at least I at least know the title of the show you're referencing, and that's about it. <laughs> I was going to explain it anyway, so now I'm explaining it for you and not just the theoretical listener who hasn't seen it. So it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Main characters, you are not supposed to like them. There are two men who have bought a boat so they can take women out into the ocean to sleep with them. And one of the characters says, well, so you're forcing them. And the other one says, no, of course, they'll be completely safe if they say no. But they won't say no because of the implication. And then the other character doesn't get it. And it's just their banter back and forth of this clearly horrible scheme. But they're never in any danger. But that doesn't matter because they won't know that because of the implication. And they suck. And that's why it's funny. Is But the exploration of situational awareness. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, anyway, that it's exploring a, a dynamic in a humorous way to make someone watching it stop and think, oh, wait, <laughs> <laughs> some people involved understand that everyone is perfectly safe doesn't mean that that gets to be uh, assumed by everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a not entirely on topic conversation, but it is, I, well, it landed better. It's definitely more recent. <laughs> <laughs> so it landed better for me. I think also in that case, it's easier to poke, like you can poke fun at it because it's a, over-the-top humorous, which is not the case with Wheel of Time. <laughs> it's not, which is why I was surprised that that one comment in the thread said his wife thought it would be funny to deal with it this way. And I was like, is funny the word she was going no, for? No, that's the comment is actually, so I, I have the comment that you were referring to, and it's a quote that was taken from, or not a quote, it's a paraphrase that was taken from a signing that Robert Jordan did, where he says that he wrote this scene as a humorous role reversal thing, and his wife, who is also his editor, thought that it was a good discussion of sexual harassment and rape with comic undertones. I guess there is humor in that's that's where you're getting the word humorous. I didn't say the yeah right. They did not yeah. use the word funny, but they used enough synonyms that I wasn't with, wrong with comic <laughs> undertones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She she seemed to think it would be a good way to explain to men what this can be like for women showing their fear. Yeah, I think I think it's a kind of humor that doesn't always hit well with a modern aud audience. At least it didn't. It didn't for me. I didn't find it. <laughs> I didn't find it particularly funny. I think. Like I said, if it wasn't so obvious where the problem was, yeah, I I could see someone reading that and going, ha ha ha, oh, you know, maybe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thirty years ago, maybe that could happen. I I get that, but it's hard to rely on a humorous reaction, like you said, from something where that isn't the genre. Mm -hmm. <laughs> When you already know you're supposed to be laughing at the characters involved, 
you know that what they're saying is ridiculous and wrong. So the show is telling you. You have a baseline yeah. from which you're operating. Whereas suddenly expecting your reader to go, oh, this must be absurd and wrong, even though I haven't played any of the other situations off that way, is that's a hard leap to expect your reader to take. Mm -hmm. But I really like that interpretation of it. It's a lot better than the alternative. <laughs> I think, I mean, this this Reddit poster lays out a very good case for that being the interpretation that Robert Jordan was aiming for. And I think it's also something that maybe it's easier to see, I don't want to say in hindsight, but like on a second or third reread when you're not, when mm -hmm. you're more familiar with the book and the characters and the context and you're not as busy trying to just keep everyone straight in your head because <laughs> there are a lot of names and places to keep straight i bet yeah that's a lot there's a lot of book titles to keep straight what are you I on don't... now number 17 24, <laughs> i finished i finished 13 so you're halfway done <laughs> i'm i'm one away I'm one away from being done. So page count wise, you're halfway done. Page count wise, I'm maybe two thirds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the first book that we'll be talking about in this episode is a book titled Of Honey and Wildfires by Sarah Chorn. And I read a Sarah Chorn book earlier this year, Serafina's Lament, and I loved Chorn's writing so much that I was like, Lily, Lily, we gotta read something by her. <laughs> we have to put this on the podcast. So I uh, bullied Lily into into adding uh, Sarah Chorn to the calendar. That's all right. I bullied you into the next one. <laughs> and you bullied me into the podcast. So I feel like there's a little, <laughs> I've got a little bit of leeway there. You're flying on borrowed time with that excuse, my dear. <laughs> I know. <laughs> But I'm going to use it for as long as I can. All right. This is the first book in a series. There are two books that are out that follow. I think actually it may just end, stay a trilogy. I'm not sure if Chorn is intending to write anything else. Although I own the other two books, I obviously haven't read them yet. So I can't actually speak to how they end or how the series ends. This is not related to Serafina's Lament, though, right? No, this is this is completely different. All right. I think the next book that follows Serafina's Lament comes out sometime late this year or next year, at some point in the near future, not far off future. Okay. Of Honey and Wildfires. I'm going to start this entire conversation with, this is an extremely atmospheric and emotional book. It does what it does very well, but I was reading this in a time where I was not in the right headspace to truly appreciate it. There's a lot of crying in this book. It's extremely heart-wrenching, but this is, this is Summer Lily. I, my <laughs> parents are visiting. We're having parties every other night. I am not in a quiet, introspective, I feel like crying for a little while mood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I definitely did not appreciate this book as much as I would if it was a bad week at work and it's been raining for the fourth month straight. And maybe one of my cats needs to go, you know, there's a song you put on when you want to cry. And that is the mood you should go into this book with. You do have, it's, it's heart-wrenching. As you said, Completely. you have to be prepared for that. Yeah. Well, and I wasn't like in a bad headspace in that this book was bad for my mental health. I was just not, I couldn't really engage with the content because I was, I have been in a really good mood. You were, you were too happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Things are good. The sun is shining. Trust me, I will pick up this book again or maybe the next one in the series when that time comes around, but because we're reading on a schedule, this this is when I read it. And I know I did not properly engage with the content because of that. Yeah, this is the kind of book that I would really like to go to a remote island in Scotland where it's gray and rainy all the time 
and like curl up in the window watching the waves reading this. Yeah, that's a great mood for this book. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that's a me problem. I wanted to preface this by saying my my commentary on this book is definitely going to be colored by the fact that I was not engaging with it how I think really would do it justice. And anyway, I just wanted to start with that because it's a very good book. So what you're saying is that we should put book two on the calendar for, you know, the winter. <laughs> yeah, except not near any of the holidays because I'm in a good mood then too. <laughs> March. There's nothing like really good going on in March. And you expect it to be spring, but it's not yet. Worst month. I'm not sure if I have such dim views on March, but... April's pretty bad too, but there's a couple of sunny days. You have different weather patterns than me also. <laughs> this is very true. <laughs> anyway, it was, as Sarah has a bullet point later that I'm going to shamelessly steal, <laughs> gorgeously written. Some of the prose was absolutely stunning in this book. I think Sarah Chorn writes grief and like the not the happy fluffy side of love but like the sharp painful side of love so well i just i was highlighting like every other sentence just because it was so pretty <laughs> and so atmospheric i think she just has a ha, utterly beautiful turn of phrase one of the other really incredible things about this book is the super fun world she builds. And I can't even call it fun because the book is so sad, but the world is super fun anyway. I, I loved the setting. It was unique and interesting. And it just like all of the little details that she dropped about it were really intriguing. And she doesn't over explain it either. I definitely still had questions about some of the specific mechanics, but it was consistent in a way that that didn't bother me at all. Mm -hmm. And I really loved the balance that she struck. Because when you're in a world, the people there probably don't know the perfect ins and outs of how this physical liquid manifestation of magic performs, which is sort of how I describe shine, this, this substance that is... Magic oil. Yeah, magic oil, but also a huge commodity and sort of the the main conflict of the book is it takes place where shine is being mined and the exploitation that follows that. And a, a very a very nuanced look at how life would go in that sort of situation. It really felt like we were reading a fantasy Wild West book, which is fun because we just read another fantasy Wild West book, the, uh, the episode, which will is not out yet, but will be soon on American Hippo. So it was nice to contrast like the two different versions of the Wild West. Only this one actually took place in what felt like an authentic West and not the South. <laughs> it was the West of this location. I didn't get the feeling that it was supposed to be Earth. No, I don't. I don't think it was supposed to be Earth. I but just it meant... definitely was in the West. So yeah. <laughs> I, I just meant that American Hippo felt like a Wild West book, but wasn't actually taking place in the West. One of the things that I kept wondering and is never really answered, and maybe it never will, and that's fine, is okay. The shine, this magic oil, affects people who are in close contact with it over periods of time, primarily by changing your color. So in this small territory where oil is the main or only industry, other than whoring, which I get why it's called that because it's the Wild West, but ouch. <laughs> and oil is also used, it is an additive in food, like it's used Their as... main medical mm -hmm. supply. It's used in their guns, like it's everywhere. So it turns people pastel. <laughs> Everyone actually, who lives here is some pastel shade. I wasn't viewing them as pastel. I was viewing them as a very vibrant color or like a dark color. No. Oh, I guess because some of the first people we meet are lilac, not purple, lilac. I, and then a lot of the blues are described in very light colors as well. 
I guess there are ruby reds, but yeah. okay. But people turn colors. <laughs> They're like that's not a like horrible way of describing skin tone, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> like actual rainbow colors. And I really wondered if the colors meant anything. If I was supposed to pick up on that and I didn't, or if there was some sort of system that maybe Chorn knew that I didn't have to pick up on, but there it was still there under the surface. And I, I wondered that. And one of my bigger points for maybe it does mean something is that families tended to turn the same color. And I thought that was very interesting. And maybe there was something there. There doesn't have to be. I just really liked that hook. It was a, a neat concept, and I'll be interested to see how or whether that plays out in the subsequent novels. Absolutely. Uh, ooh, I was about to say a spoiler thing. <laughs> there is another th- reason why I'm very excited to read more, and I'm not going to talk about it yet. <laughs> you just have to continue listening to find out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a, a weird non sequitur comment. What's your weird non sequitur comment? This book kind of reminded me of Who Fears Death. How so? The point of view, the perspective of this book. That's the only similarity. (laughs) But the way one of the main characters, Cassandra, her sections are from first person perspective, looking back on her childhood. And that was a very similar dynamic with Who Fears Death. Because it's the main character is also retroactively telling the story of her childhood through most of the book. And so that dynamic was very striking to me. But also, this whole book wasn't in first person. It kind it it didn't kind of bounce back. It absolutely <laughs> bounced back and forth between first and third person, which when I first noticed it, I wrote it down that this is happening, but it didn't actually bother me at all. It's very consistent with which characters are first person and which characters are third person. And I think that's why it worked for me. Yeah, that's not something that I really noticed beyond just a kind of like cursory glance. You notice it and then just move on because like you say, it it is consistent internally Mm -hmm. and it's very specific characters have very specific points of view. Mm Mm-hmm. And it just, it works somehow. I'm not sure if I've read another book with this alternating point of view system. I mean, I've read fan fiction that does it, and it sure don't do it well. (laughs) 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 That's true. I've read fan fiction that does it. I'm not entirely sure that the fan fiction that does it does it on purpose and Chorn absolutely does this on purpose oh yeah it's completely on purpose and and done to very good effect but I think in contrast most of the times where I've seen it done it's not good it's so when it does fade into the background so thoroughly that is a huge compliment right we're not saying the point of view (laughs) is unnoticeable we're saying my god she did this incredible thing and we didn't even notice it happening yeah it's not something that you expect to be done well but it is done well and i even yeah i even wrote that note going "Uh uh-oh but no it was fine (laughs) okay before we get into our spoiler conversation sarah why should you read this book if you want beautiful prose and a fantasy wild west setting and all of the emotions if you want to cry and cry a lot you should read this book (laughs) my answer for this question was the word emotions between tildas which is completely genuine like i said i i should have been reading this at 2 a.m after a long day (laughs) and i would have been much more into it but purely from a purely from an emotional standpoint i this book rides so hard on the emotional journey it takes you through that if you are reading it in chunks in between party life, it's not going to hit quite right. Yeah. But I'm looking forward to reading the rest of them. And I'm going to say maybe not scheduled so that we can just, so I can read it <laughs> <laughs> when I can appreciate it. I think, I think that's fair, especially given that our calendar is very full. <laughs> All that too. To avoid spoilers for Of Honey and Wildfire, skip to 4450. 
Okay, now that now that we're in the spoiler section, <laughs> what is with us in reading books where everyone dies? I, this was another book where there was a lot of death, and I was not. Maybe I should have been expecting it, given that this book has been so heavy on the theme of grief. But I just like all of Cassandra's family and all of Ianthe's family dies <laughs> near the very <laughs> end. And I was it had been it had been set up like this. It didn't come out of the blue. It had been set up. You probably if you were uh, more perceptive than me. You, you know, you wouldn't have been as surprised, but yeah, I was, I was not expecting them all to die all at once. Just, yeah. Off screen too. Off screen. That was rough. Yeah. I thought, I think that was part of what made it so rough. Like I was expecting that when they died, we would see it and you just don't like it's hinted at. And then a couple of chapters later, you, f- you find out like what actually happened, mm-hmm. but I just, <laughs> We need to we need to read more happy things. This is my <laughs> fault. I put this I put this on the calendar. Okay, it's sure not a happy book, but Matthew's ending though. Matthew being the the antagonist, the grandfather of one of the main characters. Of both of the main characters. Oh, that's true. Both of the main characters, <laughs> but one of them doesn't know it. And the other one thinks he's his father. It's anyway. There's some family drama. This book is mostly family drama. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So the character of Matthew is talked about through the entire book, either specifically with Arlen saying, my father, or the other plotline following Cassandra discussing the owner of Shine Territory. They're the same person. We hear so much about him, and then we finally actually see him at the end, and I thought that not a grand reveal, because he's exactly who we expected him to be at that point. But it was very rewarding having that character sort of finally step on screen and fill this role that has been built for him through the entire book. And then Arlen murders him. Cassandra tries and Arlen does it. And it's the best. <laughs> There's a couple it's, pages in between, but holy shit, his ending felt so good. It's so well deserved. Like if ever a man needed to be murdered, it was it was Matthew. Well, every awful, horrible thing he does, he claims to be for his offspring or for his lineage. And so then For his legacy. His legacy. But specifically the the people care. He always says his daughter, his daughter, and then his daughter's children. Well, he's ta- he talks a lot about, I think he uses legacy in the book. He does. Yeah. But he claims to care about his bloodline, his offspring. But he clearly, I mean, well, it's completely self-centered. His dialogue is always about his daughter and her children, but all of his actions are about himself. Yeah, it's, it's, he's very self-serving. And at the end, his grandchildren show the ultimate action of saying, you're actually selfish. None of this was for us. We don't want it. By killing him, destroying what kept Shine Territory, his company, isolated and gave him a monopoly over it. Or their monopoly, he said. They were going to inherit it. It was all for them or Arlen specifically. It was clearly all bullshit. And them calling him on it and fucking ending him felt so good. That's probably, for the reader, the highest moment in the book. (laughs) Both of the characters have been through shit and will go through more. But for me, that was just, it was so satisfying. It felt so good. It was, it was a nice, it's nice to see in a, in a book where all of the characters are just like put through the ringer, it was nice to finally see someone get a deserved comeuppance. Even when the characters are remembering happy times, it's always sad because they're talking about how they're so fleeting. Like, I think Matthew's death is the only moment where you just feel completely good about it in the entire book. <laughs> <laughs> 
I would be remiss if I did not bring up how much I absolutely love Elroy. Elroy was fantastic. He starts off as just kind of a side character, but by the end of the book, you're like, oh my god, I really want to know where this, like, where where his story is going. I hesitate to even say arc, because he doesn't necessarily go through change as much as we as readers learn more about him. But he's introduced as a bodyguard, just some hired schmuck for the company, for Arlen's grandfather. And he's kind of babysitting Arlen. And all he really is is hired muscle. I mean, he's he's nice about it. Oh, sure. But... They're friendly, but I wouldn't say they're yeah. friends. <laughs> <laughs> no. And he, he doesn't have a lot of standout character moments in the beginning. He's just kind of there in the background. He sure does get shot protecting Arlen. He sure does get shot protecting Arlen. This is very true. That's about all that he does, really, for the first 80% of the book. But the the bandits, Chris, Arlen's father, give him a huge dose of shine, which gets him high and makes him an addict, but also means he can survive the gunshot well, wound. No, he was shot with shine. Because they use shine in their guns. Is that how that... I thought they were shine bullets, but I didn't think that got the person who got shot high. I thought they... I mean, I thought I, they also dosed him with shine so that he would be docile while they returned him. They could have they done that too, but my impression was that, like, getting shot with shine was like injecting yourself with a whole bunch of shine. Because it's shine bullets. The rules are a little fuzzy. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they also gave him a dose afterwards. It's probably a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. But it doesn't matter. I frankly don't care. (laughs) (laughs) The next time we see him, he is doing some really horrible things because his boss told him to. And that kind of tracks with all we know about him up until that point. And this is at the very end. He's one of the people who attacks Cassandra's home. And he murders Mm -hmm. most of the main characters in the book. (laughs) To put it bluntly. But then we see him afterwards and he really has a crisis. He's struggling with what he did and how he can reconcile that with who he is. And this shine addiction that he's now that he now is suffering from through no fault of his own really through no fault of his own and his father was a shine addict so like he has seen what that can do to a person and to a family and he's essentially like questioning everything that he's believed up until now and he and arlen have a really wonderful moment arlen can recognize that he's he's going through withdrawal and really needs just someone elroy Needs someone so bad, he goes to the, like, stuck-up kid of his boss. That <laughs> I don't think that's anyone's first choice for a comforting shoulder, but he's all he had. I really hope we get more Elroy um, in the next oh two books. Oh my god, his ending. So this series is called The Cephate Chronicles or something, I believe? Uh, song, songs of Cephate, I believe. And Arlen helps Elroy through withdrawals by telling him stories of Cephate, this world tree, for lack of better term. And Elroy ends the book by heading off into the wilderness to find Cephate. And if that's not the plot of the next book, I don't know what I'll do. <laughs> it, it, has to, it has to come up at some point. Like, it has to. Oh, I, I am prepared to read anything just to get to more Elroy. I really want to know what happens with him. Most of the characters are more dimension. Well, even Matthew has his dimensionality. He's complicated, but you st- I still felt good about his ending. I mean, he's complicated, but he's he's still very clearly bad. <laughs> but the other characters, I would say adults mostly, Arlen and Cassandra are both you know, children thrust into this situation. But all of the adults are very well depicted as trying their best when they are not at their best selves. There's a lot of nuance to everyone. 
they're doing things that could without context be pretty mean but because you as the reader have an understanding for the greater context where they're coming from as people i actually found them all to be incredibly sympathetic even even in their low moments i was very sympathetic for them everyone except matthew i would just like to say that for the 10th time <laughs> <laughs> one example is annie cassandra's aunt who ends up raising her the night that cassandra's father brings her to annie she does not take it well she is not very sweet to cassandra she is not she's not happy about having a child dumped on her doorstep no especially because she thought chris the father was dead so oh by the way my brother is not dead also he has a kid and also she's my problem now and you can tell this woman is trying so hard and it doesn't work because she's only human and of course as a child that was really rough for cassandra but even as an adult because cassandra was an adult narrating this scene she understood and i really liked that how sympathetic cassandra was able to be for the adults that didn't always do right by her even if they were trying their best there's another moment um, where Imogen, who is the mother of Ianthe, Cassandra's best friend and eventual lover, turns her back on Cassandra and the entire family because Cassandra's father, Chris, has just gotten Imogen's husband killed. And like, it's so hard for Cassandra and you feel for her, but at the same time, you're like... I totally understand where Imogen is coming from. Like, she, of course, she doesn't want to have anything to do with the family of the man who got her husband killed. Like, of course she doesn't. Not just got her husband killed, like basically murdered him. Not specifically him, but. And not not intentionally, but I mean. There were direct actions. Yeah, and... it was it was a line, a straight line from point A to point death. Well, and then you get Chris. The man who did that, the absentee father of both Cassandra and Arlen, who is actually an incredibly sweet and good father when he's there. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get full points if you're only a dad 10% of the time, even if even 10, 5, 1, like a very small percent of the time. But when you do see him interacting with his children, he gets full points for that. And to be fair, it's not entirely his fault that he's an absentee father. I mean, with Arlen, for example, like he thought Arlen was dead. Yeah, not his fault at all. Not his fault at all. And with Cassandra, like he's a wanted criminal and he rightfully thinks that his sister can provide her a better life than he can, you know, on the run. Yeah, it's. He's not wrong. <laughs> and it's, I would say, okay, his fault that he became a terrorist, but you also get where he's coming from with how terrible Matthew is. I would probably want to blow his stuff up too. <laughs> I think Chris is a really um, good example of the fact that like, you can do the wrong thing for the right reason, but it still ends up being the wrong thing. He has a comment about, I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was a great liberator. I didn't realize I was the villain in my own story until it was too late to change anything because like he, he does all of, he takes all of these actions that result in a huge amount of death. And you find out later that Matthew has kind of orchestrated it all, but Chris certainly doesn't know that. And it's possible that Chris could have prevented some of that if he mm -hmm. had just, you know, thought a little bit more about what he was doing or taken different actions. Absolutely. Being so emotionally invested on people who are on opposite sides of a conflict is a really rough place to be as a reader. But Chorn sort of holds your hand and brings you through it with such really lovely prose and very insightful characters that we're seeing the world through that it, it creates a really lovely tableau. Way back at the beginning of this podcast, 
it was suggested that we discuss our top 10 books. And one of my top 10 books of all time is The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. And I absolutely insisted that Sarah read it because it's so good. And all I ever want to do is sit rereading this book for forever and ever. (laughs) I mean, I wasn't arguing too hard when you said we should add it to this calendar. And it was lovely. It was really cozy. Like, it was the kind of book that you can just curl up with. That's so interesting to me because there's definitely danger. There is danger, but... I almost felt like I was watching it on TV. <laughs> like it wasn't it wasn't real danger. It was real danger. Like the characters are very definitely in danger. Mm-hmm. But I I did have the very strong feeling that everything was going to be all right in the end. And that was mm, 95% true. <laughs> I guess that's not even totally true. <laughs> it's not totally true, but but I did like that still it felt comforting in a way that not a lot of books do i don't know how to explain it it's definitely not emotionally complicated in the way that the characters the main characters this takes place on an industrial spaceship with a small crew who are trying to basically build a freeway you know what it is (laughs) it felt like slice of life it felt like a slice of life show it's just a group of people who are really sweet to each other (laughs) And sure, there might be some pirates occasionally that may or may not murder them all. They don't actually murder them all. I don't think that's a spoiler. (laughs) But they don't know that at the time. (laughs) But the crew itself are all very supportive and positive and understanding. And I just like watching people be friends, okay? Yeah, it was nice to have characters who are generally good people doing if not good then at least not bad things (laughs) no they really are just working class construction workers but in space Mm -hmm. i well sarah you know that i'm weird about (laughs) sci-fi i think our listeners may know that by now too (sighs) i might have hinted at it a few times (laughs) but this book is really to me what sci-fi is this book is science fiction Becky Chambers herself does not have a science background, but both of her parents are are extremely embedded in that. Just on the back of the book, we have an astrobiology educator and an aerospace engineer. It's hard to get more sciencey than that. And an Apollo era rocket scientist. I'm assuming that is doubled up with one of the previous ones and not that she has three parents. Maybe she does. I don't know. I mean, I have three parents, so why shouldn't she? It's phrased. There's a comma in there. I don't know. However, she's listing it. There's a lot of science people raising this person. And I think that definitely shines through. Like I said, she is. This book is not uh, exploring quantum physics or anything but all of the theories feel very reasonable in a way that i quite enjoy it feels grounded in the possible it's not space fantasy (laughs) (laughs) i think what i really like about it is that this book does a really good job of not falling into a human-centric point of view like yes also very good yeah humans humans are not the dominant race they're just or the dominant species like they're they're just this one little minor blip but they're also not the downtrodden underdogs because that also has main character energy that humans do not deserve (laughs) that's also human centric (laughs) yeah there's this really wonderful scene between the navigator and dr chef who is the doctor and the chef (laughs) I'm sure you never would have guessed. <laughs> and also one of my favorite characters, but we'll be talking about that later. Dr. Chef nodded. You love them and you understand them, but sometimes you wish they could be more like ordinary people. <laughs> Speaking, of course, <laughs> about humans. <laughs> and that's just very good. It's so good. This book is so good. It was very good. The aliens in this book are also truly 
different species. I've complained before, probably in praise of this book, about what I now understand is a TV Tropes page called Rubber Forehead Aliens, (laughs) where the alien species are just clearly humans with some prosthetics on their face, but they have the same society, or they're, you know, one of the human cultures, but in space. And that gets, that's not an alien. That's just a human in space with some rubber on their forehead. But the different species we meet in this book are actually feel truly different societally and culturally in a way that is so much fun. I, this is a little bit of a, of a off topic segue, but I think that Charlie Jane Anders has a, an article on tour about that very thing, like the aliens with um, bits of rubber on their head Mm -hmm. in science fiction. She is also an author that I would like to read for the podcast, by the way. I'm giving you advance (laughs) advance warning. (laughs) Sounds like I agree with her. Actually, I take it back. It's not an article on tour. I think it's an article in Den of Geek where she's talking about her recently published science fiction novel, Victories Greater Than Death. Sounds good, too. I Yeah. She sounds very smart and intelligent and cultured, and like all of her opinions are perfect, from what I have heard of her. I am i haven't read anything of hers yet, but I'm a big fan. One of the other things I love about this setting is that technology is fallible. I personally split science fiction technology into two camps. You get the sort of industrial tool sci-fi, and then you get the Apple Store sci-fi, where it's people just kind of waving their hands, and then shapes appear, and then suddenly the computer can tell them exactly what will happen in five minutes based on projections. And, you know, that kind of nonsense garbage. Everyone knows when you have a new tool I don't care how many touchscreens are involved. In fact, the number of touchscreens probably makes it worse as far as fallibility goes. Something will go wrong or, you know, Excel is having a glitch. And even (laughs) though all of the equations are right, for some reason, things are still looking weird and you realize that it was pulling from the wrong spreadsheet or something. It doesn't matter how advanced you are. There should still be issues. And not deus ex machina issues. Just like like <laughs> low level issues throughout the entire story. I entirely agree. I also like just how mundane it is. Like it's not that technology is all of this fancy, like high level stuff. Mm-hmm. You just, you have, it, it permeates throughout all levels of society and all levels of usage, which just, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it is in some kind of clinically white spaceship. The Apple Store. The Apple Store, yes. <laughs> Which is not what science fiction should be. That is space fantasy. Also, like you said, it's mundane. We have some extremely cool high-tech sci-fi being used to build freeways. And yes, of course, they're punching through subspace and weaving space-time together, but they're doing that with a big old drill and they have to fly from one point to another to do that. That idea that when once we do have this technology, we're going to be using it for the equivalence of long-haul truckers, not, you know, figuring out how to clone people and all I mean, that. It's, it's using it for the day-to-day things that make ordinary life better. Frankly, for commerce. It's not science for science's sake. It's not for sending billionaires into space. Oh, well, (laughs) I wasn't going to go there. I'm going to go there. (laughs) I think there's something that we see a lot when we get to a future society, a futuristic society, where suddenly scientists are the top of society and everyone's priority is just learning and progression. But that's really not how anything has ever worked. (laughs) Once we, yeah, we're going to use this technology for practical means like building freeways. My next note is just the word algae in all caps with an exclamation point, because I really love that that's one of their main... uh... I like how that's the fuel source. Yeah, it makes so much sense. That powers all of their spaceships. (laughs) Because they can grow it. (laughs) It was a neat touch. And so one of their 
one of the crew members' job is just to maintain the algae vats and make sure they have a product of algae constantly going so they can fuel flying from point A to point B. Now, their giant subspace freeway drill requires some space nonsense gasoline, but, you know, that's fine. It's understandable that something that takes up more energy would need something a little more high-powered. Absolutely. And speaking of familiarity, (laughs) the main, I won't say conflict of the book, but the main thrust of the book is that this small crew has been hired to create a new gate into a previously Civil War-torn area because there's a heck of a lot of space gasoline there. And that's never happened in the history of Earth, so. No, that's, you know, that's total fantasy. Yeah, no one ever wants space gasoline. <laughs> Seems pretty unlikely to me. <laughs> there are so many other little details that are just so perfect for the world that Chambers has created. Bathrooms are designated by species. They use the term sapience just to refer to people because, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of people. They are all sapient, though. They have a different word for, or they have different measurements of time. So there's the standard versus like the human year. Solar. Yeah, solar year. And like all of these things just make so much sense given this spacefaring. I don't even want to say culture because there are several different cultures. Way of life. Yeah. There is, of course, the, it's called the GC. It's, It's the Star Trek Federation. And, you know, whatever. It's a bunch of different species, and they're all friends. Not friends, necessarily, but they work together, at least. And they all have history, and humans are the embarrassing, uh, not super competent ones. And it's just all so good. And all of this is just the setting. The The story of the book itself is... I don't want to... I can't get into it too much. I don't think I can stop myself from going too deep too fast. <laughs> I mean, we could just move into the spoilers. I think there's one quote that we both highlighted that you should absolutely use (laughs) to send us into the spoiler section. Oh, but first. I was going to say. Why should you? (laughs) Well, I was going to ask because you were the one who was really championing this book. I loved it too. Don't get me wrong. But I feel (laughs) feel like because this is your book, you should answer the question, why should you read this book? Oh, because they actually did science fiction correctly for once. (laughs) A, A less aggressive way of phrasing it is that you get some really incredible ensemble cast characters and a mix of adventure plotline with a little bit of mystery thrown in. We haven't even gotten to Rosemary, the main character, and you have some questions about her going into it from the very first page. And that sort of pulls you through the whole book so perfectly. And the whole time, this crew is doing their job, being really sweet to each other. Not always. I I mean, of course they have conflict, but it's always from a good intentioned place, which, like Sarah said, it's just really cozy. (laughs) You don't feel bad when you're reading this book. It's it's just, I want to know what happens next, and I really want to see more of this world, and oh my gosh, the Andrisks are the reptilian aliens, and they sound so cool, and I would really love to be best friends with one. Pretty much. I mean, yeah. yeah. Read the book for Sissix, who is the <laughs> crew member who's an Andrisk. That's why you should read this book for Sissix. <laughs> so the quote that we both pulled out, Dr. Chef is talking about some ginger that he has been growing on the ship. Although I have to admit, I like eating the flowers much more than the root. Far too potent for my taste. Nice and crunchy, though. Ashby turned his head. You know ginger's an accent, right? Like a spice? What? No. Really? Did you try to eat it whole? Oh, dear. Yes. Dr. Chef rumbled a laugh. I thought it was some sort of spicy potato. To avoid spoilers for The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet, skip to 11940. I think the rest of our discussion of this book has been broken down into character appreciation hour and then what we loved about each of them. <laughs> <laughs> the characters in this were really good. Uh, yes, absolutely incredible. I, I'll start with Sissix 
because I mentioned her up in the non-spoiler section. But that's kind of just it. I just really love her a lot. Andrisks are an alien species that are extremely affectionate and sort of omnisexual. <laughs> they raise their children in like huge tribes. They don't necessarily raise their biological children. Andrisks will sort of have a life stage where they reproduce, but then it's a different life stage where they raise children. And so you just sort of have branches where there are just flocks of little baby lizards. Except I shouldn't use that word because it's rude, but they're tiny little, it's cute. They're cute little feathered lizards. And the the various elders raise them and then they go off into the world and they all bang everybody. It's <laughs> it's a cool society. I think what I like about Sissix is her emotional intelligence. There's a scene early on where Kizzy, who is another crew member, and Rosemary, who is the human who is kind of like the reader's substitute and, and view into this world, are going shopping. And, and Rosemary is the new clerk for the ship. And Kizzy wants to buy fancy soap. And Rosemary says... Actually, I don't think that I can give you the funds for this fancy soap if it's just going to be yours. Like, that has to come from your personal funds. And Kizzy starts kind of being shitty about it. And Sissix is like, no, Rosemary has a point. Like, you wouldn't appreciate someone undermining you when you're talking about your job. So you shouldn't do it to someone else. And Kizzy, like Kizzy understands. Kizzy, Kizzy then can say, oh, you're right. You know, I, I apologize, Rosemary. But I like that Sissix has the emotional, like, intelligence to understand how Rosemary is feeling and articulate that. And also the diplomacy to handle that friction so well. Mm -hmm. She, I won't say she diffused it because they weren't fighting exactly, but they were definitely disagreeing. It wasn't like a sharp conflict, but it was a conflict. She does that quite a bit throughout the book, just sort of relating to people on their level in a way that is, well, extremely effective. <laughs> <laughs> this book really does value all types of intelligence. And Sissix is a great example of emotional intelligence, but it's really a great read for everyone has a different skill. And they should be appreciated for what they do well. All of the crew bring something different to the table. Mm -hmm. And that just because they have different skills doesn't mean that, that any of them are valued less. Absolutely. Although I have to say that, as, as I have said, my favorite was Dr. Chef, purely because I found Dr. Chef so, so relatable with his love of tea and how he just wants to spend his vacation gardening. I was like, <laughs> yes, Dr. Chef. You get me. I am you. You are me in in alien science fiction form. Oh, Doctor Chef was cool. I also love how his species. I do not remember the name of it right now. Doctor Chef is a he at the time of this book, but his species goes through different transitions based on life stage. So they're all born female, and then eventually pubert. Is there a verb for puberty? <laughs> go through puberty that's awful that's too many words <laughs> he puberts into a male <laughs> that sounds horrible <laughs> and then they and that's sort of middle age and then there's there's some other stages i forget them all i i really like how his species is set up as a counterpoint to the human race and that they're both very heavily war focused and antagonistic but the humans were able to get over that and look outside of themselves. And Dr. Chef's race spent all of their time fighting each other and are dying off because of it. And it's like, this is, this is what could have happened to humans had they not been a little bit more open-minded and, and accepting. He's such a tragic character. He has some lines about watching his his daughters go to war and that is just and all die yeah, yeah. <laughs> well he he's one of the last members of his species mm -hmm. there, there's a line about how they probably only have about a hundred years left until they're extinct mm -hmm. 
and it, it's truly heartbreaking. I mean, if you think about it, he's really a tragic figure. Like he's not necessarily he doesn't present himself like that, but mm-hmm. his story is is rough. Yeah. Ohan's as well. Ohan is the navigator. I might have called Sissix the navigator earlier, but they work together. Oh Ohan does the subspace stuff. <laughs> I think Sissix is like the normal, like everyday She's the pilot. Navi- navigation. Yeah. She's the pilot. But Ohan is cool. I also love that when Ohan was introduced to Rosemary, they were introduced by they pronouns. And Rosemary was trying really hard to be woke and so used the gender neutral G, J, no, G, Zer. Uh, is that actually how you pronounce that? I've never heard it out loud. I've always said Zer. I don't know if that's right. I mean, I've it, never heard it out loud either. So. Right. Well. And we, we all know that my pronunciation, my default <laughs> pronunciation is not necessarily the default pronunciation of everyone else. Well, either G or Z, Rosemary uses and is immediately corrected by the crew because Ohan is not gender neutral. Ohan is plural. <laughs> And I love, that's so cool. They are a host and a symbiotic virus. And the virus is what makes their species capable of navigating through subspace. And that's just such a neat concept. I love it. This book is just full of neat concepts. It is. I realize I don't talk about Farscape enough on this show, but I definitely do get Farscape vibes from it a little bit. I've not actually watched Farscape. Well, I mean, the answer to you're missing out. Have, have you watched is usually no. So, hey, I heard about this. Um, it's it's kind of a niche nerdy show, uh, but you might like it. It's from Britain. It's called Doctor Who. <laughs> oh, I've never heard of Doctor Who. <laughs> it's not like we go to a Doctor Who convention every year. That's that's not. You know, we don't do that. (laughs) You said you don't watch TV, so I assume you've never seen it. I said the answer to that question is usually no. (laughs) Not exclusively no. In case you haven't been able to tell, yes, I'm a huge Doctor Who fan. Ohan is also a tragic character because they are, well, at the end of their life cycle because of the virus. There's a line that this species, the symbiote some semiotic something like that these pairs only live to be about what is it 40 years whereas otherwise they'd live to be over a hundred it's not very long but this virus has taken on like religious connotations and they think Mm -hmm. that it's not something that they need or want to learn how to cure because the fact that they contract this virus means that they should have this virus they're all, that's also practically a superpower, so I can't really yeah. blame them for coming to that conclusion. I mean, except for the fact that if you get rid of the virus, like if you cure the virus, if you heal the virus, they still have the superpower. Mm, that's true. But Ohan, as we meet them in this book, Ohan is in the process of, of dying from this virus. And they're, I wouldn't say completely okay with it. They're definitely scared. They're scared of dying, but like that's, they believe that that's what is the right thing that needs to happen. They're afraid, but not interested in avoiding it. Yeah. And at one point, the crew actually finds a cure. And Ohan says, absolutely not. I don't want to take this to take this cure. This is anathema to me. You know, don't know. It's, it's heretical. Yeah. And so they they continue on. They do not go gentle into that good night. One of my favorite characters is Jenks. We talked a little bit about Kizzy, who was the uh, mechanical engineer, whereas Jenks is the software engineer. They definitely work together most of the time, but they have different specialties. I think they're both kind of mechanical engineers, but my understanding was that Kizzy was the senior engineer and Jenks was the junior engineer they ha- they were introduced with different titles when rosemary came aboard the ship and it was different kinds of tech mech tech whatever sci-fi bullshit word they used because he always seems to be the one who um 
does more fixing though. Well, Jenks, I, I thought was doing software stuff with the AI. Is Jenks doing software stuff or is Jenks just in love with the AI? You missed the great opportunity to say software stuff <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> You're right. I'm sorry. It's all right. I took the opportunity for all right. <laughs> I get my podcast license revoked. <laughs> but Jenks is introduced through the eyes of Rosemary while she's being introduced to the crew. And Rosemary assumes that he's a genetweak, genetically tweaked person because he is extremely short. I don't know what the right phrase is, but super duper short vertically challenged i don't know he's just short i mean but he's not like oh he's five five but he's like waist tall to the average human short very short so she assumed he had been gen gen tweaked but then we mm -hmm. all right so i've always called it gene tweak well i that's not that's not quite right. That's not true. Tell me what you first <laughs> thought it was. <laughs> so that's not true. After after this first thought, which has more to do with the kinds of words that I normally read, after that I was saying gene tweaked, not Jenna tweaked, because I was thinking of genes and not genetics. I don't know if that's if that's where you're getting Jenna tweak. It is. Yeah, I was thinking gene tweaking, but my, my initial reaction, and I had this for like the first, I don't know, like five or 12 pages. It was, <laughs> it took me a while, but I was reading it as a uh, Gennet week because I was thinking, I was looking at this word because it's G-E-N-E-T-W-E-A-K, all one word. And I was seeing Gennet like the cat and thinking it was Gennet week, not gene tweak. Which, again, says, probably says more about the kind of words that I expect to see than anything else. But I don't know. Well, obviously, I don't know if it's supposed to be gene tweak or genetweak. tweak. I definitely thought it was like genetic. I was just thinking like you're tweaking the genes. But it's genetic tweaking. <laughs> I, it's sci-fi garbage. There's no right answer. There's there's. I mean, until Becky Chambers listens to this podcast and tells us that there's one specific pronunciation, we're both right. Ooh, except if, except if, that my initial reaction <laughs> again at week, that's not right. I can admit that. Rosemary assumes that Jenks had been Jenna tweaked to be extremely short. But as we later find out, he's actually extremely short due to, a, due to birth complications and he didn't have access to genetweak technology, and so could not be. I hesitate to use the phrase corrected, because that's something that he is, you know... He, he pushes back against that. Yeah, champions against in the book. But normalized? Can I say that? Because his mother didn't have access to that technology. And so that's sort of a fun reversal of the assumption versus reality there. And where he fell on the technology spectrum... And while he has not altered his body through, you know, genetic modification, he does have a lot of what modern readers would recognize as body mods, you know, tattoos and all of that sort of stuff. And I really love his quote about that. Didn't write the page number down, though. His approach to tattoos are something that resonates a lot with me and I think likely with other people, too. I've gotten ink to remind me of all sorts of places and memories. But at the core, everything I've had done has been my way of saying that this is my body. I don't want the body that everyone else told me I should have. And I think that really speaks to a notion of bodily autonomy that I have in my personal life noticed with tattoos and specifically young women. Um, I consider tattoos the most pure form of bodily autonomy. It's a decision that you are making for yourself for no reason other than because you want it. And, and it's a decision that you can make for yourself, at least from the <laughs> perspective of a woman. Yeah. How many, like, how many opportunities do you have to say, I am doing this to myself only because I want it? Not, not a ton. Especially as relates to one's own body yes but yeah and, and this is maybe something that i should research more before bringing up but tattoos have definitely historically been more masculine but 
I know more women with tattoos today than men our age. And I really do think there is something there that resonates um, with with having control over one's own self. Mm -hmm. And Jenks, I think, phrased it very well. And I really appreciated his uh, his perception of Mm -hmm. the situation. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. Thanks, Jenks, for being (laughs) attuned to bodily autonomy. (laughs) Thanks, Becky Chambers, for writing a character who's attuned to bodily autonomy. <laughs> That's true. Uh, I was going to say, it's, it's impressive that a, a man, but he's a male character written by a woman. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> wow, who could possibly understand the appeal of having control over one's own self? One's own self? One's own self. Plural. Possessive. Whatever. <laughs> I do want to address Rosemary before we move on to other conversation topics, though, because she's not as sci-fi fun as the other characters, but I really do love her. Well, She's the reader's like entryway into this sci-fi world because she's not someone who has spent a lot of time in space. She doesn't know all of these things that the rest of the crew take for granted, so as it's explained to her, it's explained to the reader. But she's not bland. She's not a blank slate. She is just our way of learning about the world. Yeah, I mean, she she has her own character, certainly. And that slow reveal of who she is and where she came from, I w- maybe not slow. You know from the very beginning, she's got some kind of shit going on. And it, it also, like, I think the reveal happens somewhere around the midway point in the book. I, what I really like about that is, so Rosemary's father, it turns out, is this horrible villain who has been selling weapons to, like, he's an arms dealer, right? And Rosemary is trying to get away from that because back on Mars, everyone knows she's the daughter of this arms dealer and she is blamed for the sins of her father. But I like how it's essentially a non-issue in the book she struggles with it and she doesn't want to disclose the situation that she's been dealing with to the rest of the crew but when it happens the crew just takes it in stride and i love that it's not the main source of conflict for the book she even con- like purchases a false identity mm-hmm. to get away from it not false credentials and i think that's sort of the the point that the crew sticks to right mm-hmm. like she clearly knows her job also i love the concept of the accountant saves the day (laughs) she's not always an accountant she's also a translator and that's usually how she's saving the day (laughs) i mean she's she's a clerk with all sorts of varied duties that are clerk related but speaking of mundane Mm -hmm. tasks she saves their asses through all the time yeah yeah largely pencil pushing or knowing how to be polite to a stranger. And oh, it's just, this is such a good book, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good book. I did enjoy it quite a lot. Oh. Speaking of Rosemary, you have a quote about, where is it? Running away from your past? Yeah, so there's a quote in the book that actually, there's a similar quote in of Honey and Wildfires that that I'll give to, but they both relate to this idea that you are not responsible for what your parents have done. And in Of Honey and Wildfires, uh, Cassandra, who is one of the main characters, is told, only you get to decide who you want to be. You do not hold your father's sin. And in The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet, Rosemary is told, we cannot blame ourselves for the wars our parents start. And I just think that it's really important to remember that you're your own person and you're not responsible for anything that your parents might have done. And also celebrate your own accomplishments. Mm -hmm. These are two coincidentally young women who have done good with their lives and are feeling held back by their legacy. But, you know, celebrate yourself. I have a pet peeve that I wanted to talk about that I discovered 
I didn't realize that this was a pet peeve of mine, but I discovered it while looking through uh, fan fiction summaries on AO3. And I saw a summary that said, this is inspired, and then in parentheses, cough slightly plagiarized by, and then they gave the, the title and the author of the story that had inspired them. And somehow this just rubbed me the wrong way. Like they're trying to be cutesy about giving credit in a way that didn't work for me. Just say oh. this story was inspired by, you know, this title and this author. Well, especially because it's already fan fiction. Like mm-hmm. we know you're borrowing ideas. <laughs> except except it was it was inspired by another fan fiction story. No, yeah, I I have read fan fiction stories that link to other fan fiction stories and I can definitely see like how they are they read the first one and are riffing off of the same idea but took it in a different direction mm-hmm. uh, or a different angle I mean or whatever. I like I think I have that... read those pairs <laughs> of stories before I think at that point like get permission from the author like reach out to the author and say hey I want to take this this idea can I use it or and don't it's already fan fiction it's not except, their idea <laughs> it's except that I mean I and I didn't read the story so I don't know how okay. like directly it tracks because if you if you take I think there's a point, right? Like if you take yeah. the same basic idea and then go off in your own direction, just say this is inspired by. But if you cover the same like plot points, but with your own words, then you might want to get permission. But like just say, you know, inspired by or I got permission to do this. Don't try to make it cutesy. It just Well, also plagiarism isn't cute. Like yeah. that's not funny. <laughs> yeah, like the just calling it plagiarism just didn't you know I get that you were giving credit but it just it didn't work for me and I thought that it qualified as a pet peeve for the podcast no that's definitely a little disgruntling especially because sites like AO3 or nonprofits like AO3 I should say fight so hard to justify fan fiction as fair use That throwing Mm -hmm. around words like plagiarism so lightly is like, what are you doing? It just leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Yeah. I still don't think, I mean, if the the original fan fiction work is already borrowing, I assume, pretty heavily from another work. (laughs) So borrowing... That that does depend on the fan fiction, but... (laughs) Yes. But so borrowing heavily from them is just like, feels like fair game. I think, I think... In a small fandom or a, or a small subset of the fandom where stories are instantly recognizable, I think that you do have to acknowledge your influences. Oh, no. Um, yeah. But, and, but, but that's a, th- oh, maybe that's what it is. They're citing their work, which is categorically not plagiarism. Plagiarism is when you don't cite your work. <laughs> yes. It's Actually, not even not yeah. funny. It's just wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course you're supposed to link to the one that inspired you. Just like you're supposed to pick the right category for the whatever parent work that you're writing fan fiction for. That's how it works. Yeah. No, I think you have a point there. Like if if you are if you are acknowledging where you got this from, it's not plagiarism unless you are copying, you know, the actual words, which again, I didn't read this fic but I'm assuming that they are not actually Mm -hmm. copying, you know, paragraphs from the original fan fiction. I've read a fan fiction where they just did a a whole ass sequel to another fan fiction. (laughs) I think they, I think they had had conversations with that, that first author just based on author's notes, but. I mean, I've definitely read fic that is based off of other fic more than it's based off of, the parent work or once an author has created a large enough alternative universe Mm -hmm. other authors are going to play in that space and why would you complain you're already the one playing in someone else's space Mm -hmm. yeah it's not it's not plagiarism yeah it just it the the way that they were referring to their creative influences it just it didn't work for me I had a friend in college who 
was once pulled aside for a very serious conversation by one of our professors and told that she had plagiarized her essay, like one of her big midterm essays. Oh, no. Because she formatted the bibliography incorrectly. Oh, no. And I was so upset. I mean, obviously she was too. Like, this isn't about me. But, but I I was ready to storm in there. Like, where do you get off? That is that ridiculous. Is not, what means. That's- not even, like, she just formatted it wrong. And being that's, accused of plagiarism for that, that's garbage. Especially because, like, the university that we both attended, uh, you had to submit your papers through Turnitin. Yeah. So that checks for the level of, you know, the, the level of congruence with other I papers. I don't actually think any of my English professors made us do that. Well, <laughs> I, had, I, had to, I had to submit papers through Turnitin, but I also was not in the English program. I did that for like my public speaking class, but not like my actual English major classes. Anyway, the only the only English literature class I took was in freshman year. There were three Sarahs in a class of 15. That sure does sound like USF. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> That's mostly what I remember about that class. Anyway, maybe I'm a killjoy, but plagiarism isn't funny, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. And joking about it when it's not plagiarism, I, I, it just, it didn't work for me. Well, I, maybe it, it is so upsetting is because genuine plagiarism is extremely shitty. And it happens with fan fiction. Like fan fiction yeah. authors are plagiarized. Winking and making fun of that just feels bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, it sucks when your joke falls flat, but... They could just edit their summary and maybe take that out. <laughs> and who knows? Maybe they will at some point. Maybe they're listening right now. <laughs> I have my doubts about that, but maybe. <laughs> Statistically unlikely. <laughs> Quite. <laughs> Thank you so much to Jessica and Spex for helping me re-roof my house this week. And thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. Come disagree with us. We're on Twitter and Instagram at FictionFansPod. Uh, You can also email us at FictionFansPod at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts. And follow us wherever your podcasts may live. Thanks again for listening, and may your villains always be defeated. Bye. Bye.